Good morning, or is it afternoon? I've lost track of time. I'm Manya Brashear Pashman, host of People of the Pod, AJC's weekly podcast about global affairs through a Jewish lens. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are about to be on that podcast because we are getting ready to record this week's show before a live studio audience. You. <laughs> that means when you clap, our listeners will hear it. When you laugh, our listeners will hear it. And when the episode goes live later this week, you will be able to access it at ajc.org slash podcast or on your phone, Apple, Google, wherever you get your podcast and share it with your friends. That's me cackling like a hyena in the front row. That, that would be me, at least. <laughs> in just a moment, we are going to start recording. But before we do, let's do one trial run of applause. I'm going to count down and give you your cue at three, two, one. Well done, well done. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to a very special live show of People of the Pod. <laughs> Anti-Semitic rhetoric has grown at an alarming rate on college campuses and in so-called progressive spaces nationwide. Whether one supports the existence of Israel has become a litmus test for Jews who want to march for women's equality, LGBTQ rights, protecting our planet. Just last week, BDS activists in Boston published a map linking Jewish institutions, schools, houses of worship, even nonprofits that work to prevent homelessness and refugee resettlement with opposition, not to prevent it, but uh, to, they settle refugees, with opposition to Palestinian human rights and white supremacy. Here to discuss this alienation of liberal Jews from progressive spaces are Yair Rosenberg, a writer for The Atlantic Magazine, whose newsletter, Deep Shtetl, tackles these issues with wit and wisdom. I should also add, Yair has an album coming out in August, He's very multi-talented. Rachel Fish, co-founder of Boundless, not just a think tank, but a think action tank for education on Israel, and David Badil, comedian, screenwriter, television personality, and author of the book, Jews Don't Count. Welcome, friends. <laughs> so I have to begin with a confession of my own. Um, I was a religion reporter in Chicago for many years before I came to AJC, and I remember in 2017 when activists were turned away from the Chicago Dyke March because they were carrying rainbow flags with the Star of David. I remember getting calls from my sources at AJC, and I shrugged my shoulders, so some people got turned away from a rally. That's unfortunate, on to bigger news. I did not see a story there, because I didn't know that this was part of a nationwide, if not worldwide, trend of excluding Jews from these so-called progressive spaces. I say so-called progressive spaces. I'm, I'm thinking back yesterday to Katarina von Schnurbein's comments. Uh, she is, of course, the EU Commissioner for Combating Anti-Semitism. She pointed out that if anti-Semitism exists in these spaces, it indicates a lack of progress. So perhaps progressive is not a precise word. But I didn't see that this was bigger news. Yair, as a journalist, who is on top of all of the trend lines, who explains these issues so well and puts them in context for readers, where else besides the LGBTQ space that I just mentioned, where else have you seen this happen? So first, I just want to thank you for having me here, all of you for being here. It's my job to sit here and listen to people talk about anti-Semitism. I'm not entirely sure what all of you are doing. Um, I'm only slightly alarmed. Um, the question of Jews and inclusion in uh, progressive spaces is a complicated one because uh, there are the vast majority, this is a journalism question, the vast majority of progressive spaces uh, don't exclude Jews. And as a result, no one writes any stories about them, just like nobody writes any stories about the planes that don't crash. Um, even though it's an incredible miracle that thousands upon thousands of airplanes take off every single day, um, no one writes a Pulitzer Prize winning story about how that happens. Only the one plane that crashes, everybody can name what that is. And that's true about Jews who encounter anti-Semitism on college campuses, Jews who find exclusion in things like the Chicago Dyke March. Um, this is definitely something that we've seen as a growing trend. Um, where I would argue, and we can get to this later, that progressive groups are not actually living up to their own stated values of things like intersectionality um, and not applying their own values to Jews. Um, and then 
basically making the decision that Jews are all just writ large, privileged white folks um, who don't uh, experience the world uh, in much more unique and complicated ways. Um, so yeah, so I, that's, that's how I would understand it. I don't think that, uh, I think it's important to put that, that context around it. Sometimes this gets put in a, in a very large alarmist frame. Uh, but as to say, a person who goes and speaks on college campuses and talks to very diverse audiences about things like Israel, um, I've been waiting to be protested off of campus, but it, it just hasn't happened yet. Okay. Clearly, I'm doing something wrong. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want, I want to acknowledge those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And then I, at the same time, and I think that's going to be the focus of this panel, I want to acknowledge the fact uh, that sometimes Jews, uh, especially Jews in like more uh, activist or campus settings, mm -hmm. will walk into a room um, and they'll get uh, sort of carded. They'll get uh, interrogated. Um, about their relationship to a state thousands of miles away um, that they're not a citizen of and that they just happen to share religion with those people with. Now, if a Muslim walked into a space and the immediate reaction was to uh, sort of interrogate them about their views about different groups in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, we would all hopefully understand that that was a form of bigotry. Uh, but we still see this sort of thing happening uh, to Jewish people. Um, and part of uh, the task, I think, of... Uh, Jewish people in these spaces and activists and writers and people who care about this issue is to explain to people uh, how to apply their principles fairly and evenly so that Jews are included the same way as everyone else. Mm -hmm. Rachel, uh, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would actually disagree a little bit with Yair. Uh, I've been working on college campuses and with students for over 20 years. And I don't think that every campus is burning, but I think what Brett Stevens said earlier is that there is a reality that for some campuses, it is a five alarm fire. We know, for example, that it is not always just about Israel, right? Israel can be a lightning rod, but there are plenty of students who have nothing to do with Israel, don't know what their relationship is with Zionism, and yet they are asked to check their identity in terms of their Jewishness at the door. So we saw, for example, last summer, in the wake of May 2021 conflict between Israel and Hamas, student groups like Students Against Sexual Assault, nothing to do with politics of the Middle East. Now, these were student groups, not university administrators, but those student groups issued statements that clearly articulated that Jews had no place in these groups because, by default, they are supportive of the IDF, which engages in sexual assault against Palestinians. And therefore, these Jews are not welcome in these spaces, even if they themselves are victims of sexual assault because of this perceived extension of association with Israeli behavior and Israeli action, which is blatantly false in a blood libel. Now, what do you do if you're that student? Well, I can tell you, I get calls from those students. The majority of those students desperately want to be accepted by the group whatever it may be, whether it's LGBTQ+, whether it's students against sexual assault, whether it's feminist movements, whether it has to do with other minority communities. And they beg for a crumb to be accepted into that room. And I have to tell you, it's all of our jobs to actually tell them to stop begging. We need them to stand up, to stand extremely tall, and to have the moral courage to recognize that those organizations and individuals are engaging in clear hypocrisy and acts very often associated with anti-Semitism, and then they have to be called out for it. <laughs> now, I just want to say, because I am an academic, I'm a historian by training, there's real opportunity to call in. And the reason we have to call in is because the majority of individuals, especially 13 to 35 years of age, are what we call don't knows. Straight up don't knows. Because if you ask them what is anti-Semitism, yet Yair has heard me say this, we did research, most of them say, uh, what's a Semite? Fair question. Then they also want to know, well, I'm anti-racist, I'm anti-Islamophobic, I'm anti-homophobic, so I'm probably an anti-Semite. <laughs> <laughs> now we chuckle. We chuckle because we can, and we know what anti-Semitism is. But it's actually not a laughing matter. Because the younger you go, the more clear it is that they actually don't know what Jew hatred is. So we need to label it very clearly by calling it Jew hatred or hatred of Jews, and educate them and sensitize them around Judaism, Jews, the Jewish people, and the state of Israel. 
So, so Rachel, I want to pick up on that. Is education the answer? I mean, in today's political climate, can Jews, uh, can, they, can you be proudly Jewish? Can you be pro-Israel in a progressive liberal space? Yes, but you might have to create your own organization and club. Okay. And you have to be okay doing so. Yeah. But I want to just say one other thing and then happy to hand it over to you, David, which I is... I think it's over. I think, I th I think the whole thing is <laughs> 25 minutes. <laughs> no, but I'll just say last thing, which is you have to be able to educate, but we're foolish if we think that education alone solves for this problem. Yeah. Okay. David, I, I would like to turn to you. Your, your book, Jews Don't Count, doesn't necessarily deal with exclusion, but blatant anti-Semitism that we see from these so-called progressives who are self-proclaimed anti-racist. They've read the how-to books. They've read everything by I Ibram X. Kendi. They're, they're as woke as they can get. But um, as we devote ourselves to the fight against racism, anti-Semitism is often ignored. And I'm curious, how do we get across to anti-racists that anti-Semitism is a form of racism? Uh, well, that's at the core of my book. Just say, I sort of, in terms of the discussion so far, I sort of exist somewhere between the two. Yair is right that the, within the progressive space, anti-Semitism would be seen, and this is what my book is about, uh, as a type of absence, a type of neglect. It has to be seen in the context of an intense intensification of identity politics, by which I mean concern. Uh, for minorities, concern from al for allyship, concern from people who define themselves as on the right side of history, as progressives, for all other minorities. And within that, one has to ask, why is anti-Semitism, why is, are Jews so low down in the mix? And it's quite hard to describe that in a way because you're describing something that isn't there. Um, but I begin my book with about 12 examples of that, and the reason that I think it is dangerous is that I think it's very quick from those things to extreme forms of what you might call active anti-Semitism. So what I would, so for example, um, uh, I, just to use a New York example, okay, uh, when my book came out, I was asked to write an op-ed for the New York Times about my book by a junior editor, I guess, uh, there. And so I wrote it and I think it was okay. And then she had to apparently ask someone further up at the New York Times whether or not this was going to run. And they didn't say anything about the article. They didn't say the article was terrible and badly written or whatever. They just said, I don't think this is what we should be focusing on at the present time. Mm. Right? So, and that's the attitude. The attitude is it's not important. Anti-Semitism is not important. And the reasons it's not important, once you burrow down into it, is where the anti-Semitism kicks in. Because it's a notion that Jews are essentially powerful, privileged, white, which is very important. The notions of white, I see Jews as what I call Schrodinger's whites, by which I mean Jews are white or non-white, depending on the politics of the observer. Mm. So the far right have seen Jews as non-white for centuries, uh, and obviously Hitler saw Jews as non-white. The uh, Nuremberg laws were racial purity laws. But meanwhile, the prog progressives see Jews as kind of super white, mm -hmm. right? They see Jews because of their notions of power and privilege. Whenever a Jew does anything, if a Jew does a bad thing, uh, you'll see constantly that Jew referred to as a white man, normally a man, but as a white person. Uh, and there's no slack given to Jews for being Jews in that circumstance. So at the heart of this, to come back to your question, is Jews need to be included in what I call the sacred circle of minorities about whom these progressive people do care about. Mm -hmm. And one way you can possibly do that is by stressing that anti-Semitism is racism. And it's extraordinary how, particularly in this country, there is pushback against that. Mm -hmm. It's partly because racism is such a hallowed term now, and it's ring-fenced essentially for mainly for the black community. Mm -hmm. And I know why the white America might feel that. But the truth is that, here's how I make it clear, I'm an atheist. I've always been an atheist for years. That would not have given me any free passes out of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. right? My great uncle, who died in the Warsaw Ghetto, was a secular Jew. As far as I know, he had no belief in God, mm -hmm. but that he still died. It is totally, it, and now, white supremacists do not ask whether you keep kosher before they burn down your house, <laughs> right? So it is racism because this is an indelible thing. I can't change it about me. It doesn't matter uh, how I pray, and, and they are not interested. But you do get intense pushback against it. But the, essentially, in terms of the education that Rachel's talking about, you need to, the young people in particular, 
it is hard for them to understand what anti-Semitism is. So therefore, if you make it simple and say, well, it is a, an accident of birth for which you are discriminated against, just like people of certain skin color are, then perhaps you're moving them towards a simplicity of understanding, and they will get on side. So let me, you said that this is an American phenomenon, this, this um, hesitation. In Britain, it's much more straightforward. You can talk about anti-Semitism being racism <coughs> without there being that much pushback. So here's a little scoop for you. Uh, I don't know if I should say it, I'm going to say it. So when Whoopi Goldberg did her thing, um, in which she basically said the Holocaust was not a racist thing, mm -hmm. I, I was interviewed on British TV in a clip that went viral explaining why it utterly was a racist thing. The Holocaust was entirely a race-based thing. And by the way, it doesn't matter whether Jews are a race biologically or not. The point is, in history, we have been racialized. Mm -hmm. The racists have decided we are a race, and that is what counts if you're trying to counter racism. So I went on TV and explained this, and then the head of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, called me up and said, can you just run that past me again? And I did, and then they changed their definition of racism. As I, and they, they said the next day that anti-Semitism was racism, something they'd been avoiding I up do, to that point. I do recall Thanks. that. I do recall that switch. You also used a term, Schroding. Can you unpack that? Schrodinger. Schro Sh what? Schrodinger. Sorry, it's a <laughs> science term. You've heard of Schrodinger's cat, right? No? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. This will be fun to explain to our yeah. broad okay. auditorium. This is going to take an hour to explain. <laughs> but, but also just wonderful for the family audience. Yeah. Uh, Schrodinger's cat is a scientific experiment that a physicist called, called Schrodinger did. He was trying to explain how quantum physics works, and basically he, he imagined a cat in a box, and, before he, uh, and it's got a poisonous thing in it. it this could take too long. But basically, <laughs> he imagined that before you open the box, you don't know if the cat is alive or dead, and quantum physics would say it is simultaneously alive or dead. Okay. So when I say Jews are Schrodinger's whites, I mean that Jews are simultaneously white or non-white, depending on the politics of the observer, which is the person who is deciding for us, it's not really up to us. Right, right. It's not really up to us how we identify as far as racists are concerned. Right, that I, that I get. I want to ask a question for all, to all three of you. Based on your observations, your personal experiences, what are the consequences of silencing Jewish voices on progressive issues and ignoring the fact that anti-Semitism is a form of racism? I mean, do we opt out? Do we? You mentioned forming our own Jewish uh, responses to, to these causes, or that being one of the less desirable options. Uh, do we, do we, you know, let me ask, leave it at that. Let me pose that to all three of you. I think that uh, what's often overlooked in these discussions is that um, the exclusion of Jews and the centering of, say, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a sexual assault uh, activism group, in an anti-racism group, in a minimum wage advocacy group, whatever you name the list, when you start deciding that a, an intractable conflict thousands of miles away is going to define who can and can't participate, you are going to splinter your own movement. You're going to get it bogged down in a whole bunch of controversies that have nothing to do with your core goal. If you're truly a mission-oriented organization, you should have that mission, and anyone who wants to sign up should be able to sign up. And this is not just true on Israel. I think we've noticed this um, in a lot of progressive groups across the board, and people who care about progressive values, this is starting to worry them, which is that they tend to break down over conflicts, over unrelated issues, because everyone is expected to buy in to a hundred other litmus tests, none of which have anything to do with the progressive value that was purportedly being advanced. Mm -hmm. um, and if you care about that value, then you should care about those things. So you can say, what are the consequences for Jews, but what are the consequences for everyone else of doing something like this? Right, right. Rachel? I, I fully agree, and I would argue that it's about reclaiming. And sometimes you can't reclaim a particular organization because it has been hijacked and their human rights litmus tests have been manipulated for a particular political agenda. Mm -hmm. So when you can't reclaim it and you know that these are values you care about, these are issues that you identify with, you have to then create. You don't cede the space. You have to cre create new organizations in those spaces. But you don't need an actual bureaucracy. You need a gang. You need one or two other people who feel like you do about that particular cause, who make it your mission in order to deal with that issue, because focusing on the conflict or on something related to Israel is completely um, pushing the main focus aside, 
And ultimately, it does a disservice. And it's not just to the Jews. It does a disservice for the larger population. And this is where I will say that what happens on campus doesn't stay on campus. Right? For 20 years, we were told by leaders in the Jewish community, and not from David Harris. David Harris was an exception, and I say that with all earnesty. Uh, but we heard, and I heard it from individuals, don't worry, you'll graduate. It's just a handful of professors. Don't worry, you'll get married. It'll be fine, you'll join a synagogue. And I was the one raising the flag with a couple of other folks who said, what happens on campus doesn't stay here. It's not Vegas, right? It goes beyond campus. And so we see that. We see it in mainstream politics. We see it in the media. And now we see it in social justice movements. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to clarify, you're saying not coming up with your, a Jewish response. No. Just a, a new response. This I'm saying if that group doesn't want me, right. then I don't want to be part of that group. But that doesn't mean I don't have a claim on addressing those particular issues because I care about those issues. Mm -hmm. That's not a Jewish response. That's a response to whatever the, the issue that I care about is focused on, environmentalism, LGBTQ+, minority issues, whatever it may be. But I'm willing to call out the absurdity of the hyper-focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. And David, what is the consequence of, of silencing these voices, but also just ignoring the fact that anti-Semitism is racism, hesitating to equate the two? Well, so I, I, I think the, I said earlier that, that this neglect feels like a passive thing, but it has, as I say, active consequences. So, if, so for example, uh, when 11 Jews were massacred in Pittsburgh in 2018, within half an hour, uh, a, a woman who sits in the House of Lords in Britain, who is a member or was a member of the Liberal Democrats, so therefore a progressive, uh, and who in fact decided to support Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party at the time, within half an hour, she had put a Facebook post out saying, this is terrible, this is terrible, but when is anyone going to talk about what is happening uh, in the Middle East at the moment? When is anyone going to realize that these events are linked to what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing? And of course, the person who killed those people was a right-wing, white supremacist terrorist, not in any way, not even interested in what's happening in the Middle East. But the assumption is, and the reason that I would tie that in to this passive neglect of anti-Semitism, is that that stems from the same notion that Jews must be in some way too powerful to be victims. Mm. That's the sense. The Jews are too powerful and too privileged, and so therefore when bad things happen to them, they must be in some sense responsible, and the power must in some sense still lie with them. Mm -hmm. So I saw this again recently. So when the terrible killings happened in Buffalo, uh, very recently there was a woman on The View, that discussion program, uh, The View, and she tried to describe the great replacement theory, the great replacement theory being the thing that the Buffalo killer who released a manifesto, mainly about how much he hates Jews, uh, why he did the things that he did. And in describing it, that woman misdescribed it. She said the great replacement theory believes that a cabal of elites and Jewish people are frightened that they're going to be replaced by black and brown people. <laughs> and that just happened on The View, and no one said, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. What the Great Replacement Theory believes is that white people, white supremacists, think that Jews are secretly manipulating immigration and multiculturalism in order to replace white people. Right. That's what it is. And in, as such, we are with black and brown people as targets for white supremacists. Mm -hmm. We are vulnerable right. because of the Great Replacement Theory. Right. I almost got a round of applause when people weren't sure. That's fine. <laughs> uh, but, but the point is the same Maybe that was a subconscious slip, but it's the same thing. It's an inability to put Jews in the arena of the vulnerable, despite history. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Well, certainly AJC has worked very hard to, to educate people on, on great replacement theory, these kinds of conspiracy theories that uh, define and characterize anti-Semitism. And I know that um, I should have probably listened to those AJC sources a little bit more closely when I was, when I was covering religion uh, in Chicago. And I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us here today. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.